Yankees have loaded a sweep, keeping MLB's Dream World Series alive. Plus, Cooper Flagg signed a major deal before his first college game. We're looking at baseball's present and its history through one of the sport's most influential voices. And later, we're speaking with NFL player Frank Ragnow. It's Wednesday, October 30th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we're speaking with my colleague Alex Schiffer on Cooper Flagg and why he holds Gatorade's first men's basketball NIL deal. We're also speaking with the one and only Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, on this World Series and one that happened exactly a century ago. Later, we're chatting with the Detroit Lions center Frank Ragnow on the evolution of that team, playing on Thanksgiving, and the growing NFL schedule. Plus, we have stories from the NFL, college football, tennis, and sports media. First, here are your top headlines. The New York Yankees kept the World Series hopes alive after staving off the Dodgers for at least one more game last night. Alongside New Yorkers, I'm sure MLB is rooting for the Yankees to keep the series going as long as possible. Prior to Game 1, the cheapest tickets on the secondary market in both New York and Los Angeles were selling for north of $1,100. Game 1 averaged 15.2 million viewers across the U.S. and 14.4 million in Japan. Game 2 saw U.S. viewership dip to 13.8 million, but Japanese viewership rose to an average of 15.9 million. Every single game of the series has come as a huge payday for MLB, and they'll take all the cash outs they can get. Adidas announced that they reached an out-of-court settlement with rapper Kanye West to end all legal proceedings between the two. The apparel giant also mentioned that no money changed hands in the settlement. CEO Bjorn Gilden said, There are tensions on many issues, and when you put the claims on the right side and you put the claims on the left side, both parties said we don't need to fight anymore and withdrew all the claims. Dwayne Wade defended the look of his statue after the Miami Heat unveiled it to mixed opinions, namely the opinion that it doesn't look like him. Wade was personally involved with the creation of the statue that took a reported 800 hours to complete and said in its defense, if I wanted it to look like me, I'd just stand outside the arena and y'all can take photos. It don't need to look like me. It's the artistic version of a moment that happened that we're trying to cement. The NFL set another viewership record this past weekend. Sunday night's matchup between the Cowboys and the 49ers drew nearly 24 million viewers, making it the most watched week eight matchup in league history. That means that this regular season game averaged nearly 10 million viewers more than the aforementioned World Series game one. Just your weekly reminder that football remains king in the United States. In the NBA, the Philadelphia 76ers have been fined $100,000 by the league for public statements around the health status of Joel Embiid, referring to GM Daryl Morey's comments last week that Embiid and Paul George would likely miss the second leg of every back-to-back this upcoming season. According to Shasham Sharania, the investigation showed that the Sixers did not violate player participation policy with Embiid's missed games, but Morey's public comments did not properly reflect the health issues with his knee. A weird one here that we'll keep an eye on throughout the season. Over to the world of college sports, Gatorade signed top recruit Cooper Flagg to the first men's college basketball NIL deal, joining other blue chip Gatorade athletes like Shador Sanders and Paige Beckers. If you're surprised to hear that this is Gatorade's first men's college basketball deal, join the club. Was the company just waiting for the right guy? Front office sports breaking news reporter Alex Schiffer joins us next to discuss. Joined now by front office sports breaking news and enterprise reporter Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Alex. What's going on, Owen? Hey, great to have you on. So Cooper Flag has signed um, with a deal with Gatorade. It's Gatorade's first NIL deal with a men's college basketball player. What stands out to you most about this deal? Yeah, I guess I'm a little surprised. I'm a little not surprised that that he was the first. You know, there's been a lot of NBA international draft prospects the past couple of years. You look at the back to back years for for the Frenchman with Victor Wembanyama and the guy on the Hawks whose name just escaped my head. Um, reigning rook. Um, hold on. It is Zachary Richache. Look at me remembering on the fly. Um, so I. I I'm a little surprised there has been one, but we think about Scoot Henderson going to the G League and then some of these guys mostly being international from the top of the most recent drafts. I guess you can kind of go down the process of elimination and be like, all right, I guess I guess it's not a surprise that he's their first one in the NIL era just based on that. Yeah, I mean, it is a little surprising just because Gatorade feels like one of these ubiquitous brands, you know, like Coke and Nike that you just feel like always has, you know, a presence. But maybe they're just aiming more for elite athletes, not that there haven't been any of those and but that they could have chosen from in the NL era, but I guess he, he's their first. We'll see how it goes from there. Yeah. Also, you think about, not to cut you off, I mean, Gatorade obviously has a huge relationship with the University of Florida, given its name and, and how it came to be. If you remember those infomercial commercials back during the day, um, 
you know, given how down the athletic program has been in the NIL or between basketball and football, I feel like maybe there would have been a natural pairing there in like the Billy Donovan years where they went back to back or the Tim Tebow years. Like maybe we would have seen uh, an alternate reality where it's a Florida player given the history there. But uh, given where the athletic department is right now, I guess not as much of a surprise. They go outside of the state for uh, for their first basketball player. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing that, I mean, this isn't exactly a, a new revelation or anything, but Cooper flag is already seen as like this established star who is, you know, going to go to the NBA probably as the number one overall pick in the next draft. He hasn't even played a college game yet. Yeah. He's had a ton of hype around him. I, I think Cooper flags, a really interesting guy just from a, what we know about in perspective, even just off the basketball court, he's from Maine, not really a place known for as a basketball hotbed. Uh, he signed with New Balance, which has Kawhi Leonard, Jamal Murray, Cameron Brink. But again, it's not a, you know, he spent his whole amateur career with Nike, including Duke. Um, he's a twin, which is interesting just because there's a lot of twins coming into basketball. You look at Brooke and Robin Lopez, the Thompson twins, Mark even Marcus Morris. Uh, in my other life, I did a story, 2% of all NBA players last year were, were sets of twins. You know, he kind of feeds into that. Um so very interesting guy from a from a background perspective. And to your point, you know, he comes into Duke at a time where they're getting hot under John Shire. He had a really good showing with the USA Select team. He was the youngest guy there with, to help practice with the Olympic guys. And uh, the, the hype is real with him. I'm really curious how much he can live up to it, given, given everything that's been talked about with him before, to your point, he's played a college minute. Right. Yeah. And even if he was like the number four pick or something that at this point would feel like, well, like what happened to him? Did, did he get injured or something yeah. um, along those lines? Do you see any chance that this is not his only year in college that he ends up staying an extra year at Duke? I would be shell shocked. Um, maybe if he gets hurt, um, you know, but the other thing you have to keep in mind, speaking of twins um, and Duke, Carlos Boozer's kids, Cameron and um I've been terrible with names on this appearance, Owen. You should have not have me on for a while. Um, Cameron and Caden Boozer have recently committed to Duke. You know, Cameron Boozer, who's the better of the two of them, and Cooper Flagg essentially play the same position. They're both these wings who could also play some power forward a little bit, like like Dad with, with in the case of the Boozers. So I have a hard time seeing them coexist together next year, given, I mean, it'd be an overwhelming amount of talent. You can have two top two picks literally back-to-back, -back, but... I don't see a world in which Cooper Flag stays in college. I feel like even if he gets hurt, it's in his best interest to go to the NBA, start earning money, make it working on that second contract, et cetera. So um, and that's a long way of saying no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, as much as we talk about how NIL changes the equation, and it does when you can make millions of dollars in college, it's still like if you get to the NBA sooner, that means, yeah, that second contract where you can make tens of millions, that happens a year earlier, and maybe you get another year or two of that earning power. So long term, I feel like the equation's still roughly the same. Um, you know, even though you can get security earlier with through NIL. I think it's going to take a certain, I think there will be people who stay in school next year who are draft prospects because of NIL. I think it's going to be very situational basis where maybe it's a loaded draft and you're a borderline first, second round pick you know, where the contract guarantees kind of fade away as you go from first to the second round. Maybe that person who sees a weaker draft at their position the following year says, I'm going to come back for NIL. Then I can really shoot up the draft boards if things go my way. Um, maybe a back-end lottery pick, but again, to me, the money's still too good. You know, we're also talking about the CBA increasing a lot with the new media rights deal and those rookie contracts going up a bit. I think I do think there will be players who stay in, the, in school because of NIL. I just don't think they will be locks to go in the first round i think they'll be the the borderline people who like college enough to want to go back another year and maybe that if enough people come back that team can make a big run um i do not think the cooper flags who've been talked about as a number one pick for the last three to four years since they were teenagers will be that that poster child but i, I do think that we will have a conversation on the podcast at some point of somebody choosing nil over the pros just not as much of a surefire prospect as cooper is yeah that makes a lot of sense Alex Shiver, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Owen. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. 
Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. This month, the center of the tennis world has not been Paris or London or the U.S. It has been Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The city is hosting the WTA finals, and earlier in the month, it brought together six of the best men's players for the newly created Six Kings Slam. All of this is being funded by the country's public investment fund, the same entity that backs Live Golf. And not coincidentally, the prize pools are setting records. Both the WTA finals and the Six Kings Slam, an exhibition with only six matches total, each carried a prize pool of over $15 million. Yannick Sinner, Carlos Alcaraz, Novak Djokovic, Rafael Nadal, Holger Rune, and Daniil Medvedev each got a million and a half dollars just for showing up at the tournament, and Sinner took home the biggest prize in tennis history, more than $6 million, for winning three three-set matches. Sinner said that the money's nice, of course, but he was there because it was an opportunity to compete with the best players in the world. Alcaraz, who lost to Sinner in the finals, said that he was there for the money. Either way, Saudi Arabia has found that if you just offer massive payouts, you can bring the best players in the world to the country, and it's way easier and cheaper than doing what they did with Live Golf. Cosm struck a deal with the NFL to broadcast their games. If you don't know what Cosm is, it's a unique combination of a live game experience with something like a movie theater. They have custom-built venues <clears throat> where you can watch a game on a screen that show the game as if you had front row seats at the stadium. It's a new way to watch sports, and we haven't really had one of those in a while. There's alt-cast, there's multi-view, and there's some new bells and whistles, but Cosm feels qualitatively different. That said, it's going to be hard to grow beyond a niche phenomenon because it requires big physical venues and you're still competing with people's TVs at home. That said, I would be willing to bet that Apple is eventually going to roll out something like this at some point, but it won't be in a theater. It will be on their Vision Pro headsets. You can already watch MLS games on the Vision Pro, and at some point in 2026, when the World Cup comes to the U.S., the guess here is that they will seek to transform the sports viewing experience. The Unrivaled League would really like to sign Caitlin Clark, and in the meantime, they're bringing on a former Iowa teammate of hers. Kate Martin just finished her first WNBA season with the Las Vegas Aces, and she is now Unrivaled's 27th player. That leaves only three spots for the three-on-three -three league, just over two months before it begins. How much does Martin's presence improve the comfort level for Clark? It's hard to know, but anything Unrivaled can do to move the needle here is worth it. Clark is the WNBA's biggest draw by far, and it would be a massive boost to Unrivaled to bring her in. As for Martin, she is a draw in her own right. Her jersey was the fourth best seller in the WNBA last season after Clark, Angel Reese, and Sabrina Ionescu. Michigan quarterback Jack Tuttle is retiring after sustaining his fifth concussion. That makes him the second college quarterback in a week to make that call. NC State's Grayson McCall did the same thing, saying, As much as I love this game and everything it's done for me, I can't put myself through that again. It's not worth it at the end of the day. A lot of players are going to have, make, have to make this decision, and it's a dicey one because it's not just about health. It's also about money. Tuttle and McCall were probably not going to the NFL. They may have lost some NIL money by bowing out, but that's about it. Tua Tagovailoa, on the other hand, would forfeit about $45 million if he retired. Granted, he would get to keep $167 million from his current contract, but the money is going to be part of this calculation, and that's not including his potential earnings after his current deal. Everyone is going to make the decisions that make the most sense for them, but there are going to be some borderline calls here that could get pretty uncomfortable. Bob Kendrick is a living library of facts and stories about the Negro Leagues, and he can put this historic baseball season into context like no one else. We spoke about this World Series, the first Negro Leagues World Series played one century ago, and what today's stars like Aaron Judge and Juan Soto took from their visits to the museum. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did, and that's coming up next. Very excited to be joined now by Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Welcome, Bob. Oh, and man, it's great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, yeah. Always great to have you on. Uh, so this World Series is getting more attention than any World Series in a long time. What kind of impact do you think this is having? Well, it's having a tremendous impact. You've got two, first and foremost, two of the biggest media markets in the country 
and then two storied baseball franchises who have so much postseason history going at it and stars. It is star studded. So naturally, it's going to grab your attention, even if your team is not participating. And so those 30 other teams that didn't quite make it that far, I'm sure they tuned in too, because when you've got that kind of star quality, you can't help but want to see what's going to unfold. Yeah, and some of those stars like Juan Soto, Aaron Judge, you know, the a Dodgers manager Dave Roberts visited the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, yeah. you know, some recently. What kind of impact did it have on them? Like it does, I think, on any athlete of any kind, but particularly those who make their living in baseball. It it is eye opening, particularly because most of those young athletes they may now have heard about the Negro Leagues. They don't really know the story of the Negro Leagues. And as I've oftentimes said on no sport holds to its history the way baseball does. It is that one sport where we consistently compare the stars of the past with the stars of today. And unlike the other major sports where it seemingly is a given that the guys who played today were better than their counterparts of yesteryear, that's not the same in baseball. Whoever your favorite baseball player was when you were a kid, in all likelihood, is going to be your favorite baseball player for the rest of your life. And for me, it was Henry Aaron. And so in my mind, there will never be a baseball player better than Henry Aaron, even if they are better than Henry Aaron. I'll never admit it. But that's the romantic nature of baseball. So as you can well imagine, when they come into this museum, they are blown away because... As I talk to them, the one common denominator that they share with the players from the Negro Leagues, love of the game. You play this game because you love it. Now, sometimes we as fans can get a little fickle because we equate everything to money. And because they're able to make a great living playing the game, I think some of us just assume that they don't love it as much as the players from yesteryear. Yeah, they do. They're still playing a game on that they played for free when they were a kid. And if they had to play it for free, they would still be playing this game for free. But as I share with them, you will never see a greater love of the game, or I should say a greater example of love of the game than you do when you walk through the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. They had to love it in order to endure the things that they had to endure, as I will oftentimes have indulged them to imagine this. These athletes could ride into a town, fill up the ballpark, but yet not be able to get a meal from the same fans who had just cheered them or not have a place to stay. So yes, they would have to sleep on the bus and eat their peanut butter and crackers until they could get to a place that might offer them basic services. But what you have to admire is they never allowed that set of social circumstances to kill their love of the game. And their spirits were such that if I've got to sleep on the bus and if I've got to eat my peanut butter and crackers, I'm going to keep playing ball. And that resonates with them because they understand that this game is difficult to play under the best of circumstances, no less the immense social pressure that these athletes were under. And I do think by the time they walk away from this experience, I think they get a greater appreciation for just how good they have it in the game. Yeah, definitely. And when you think of, you know, players like Soto and Judge visiting the museum, was there anything that was particularly eye-opening for them? Well, they instantly wanted to talk about Elston Howard, the first Black Yankee. And Juan wanted to hear more about the connection between the Negro Leagues and Spanish-speaking countries. And he had been kind of privy to some of this already. I don't know if he realized how extensive this was. You see, Negro League players were oftentimes the first Americans to play in many Spanish-speaking countries. And on when we went to those countries, we were treated like heroes. We stayed in the finest hotels. We ate in the finest restaurants that those countries had to offer. And then, of course, you come back home and you were treated like a second-class citizen. So as a result, a lot of Negro League players would call those Spanish-speaking countries home for one simple reason. In those countries, we weren't black baseball players. We were just baseball players. And that's all they ever wanted to be. In this country, that dark-skinned Spanish-speaking athlete 
like Juan would not have been able to play in the major leagues. Now, once upon a time, white Cubans could play in the major leagues. But if you were really of any other ethnicity and particularly Afro-Latino, you couldn't play. And so they found sanctuary playing in the Negro Leagues. And as I remind all of my guests that when Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier, he doesn't do it for just American born blacks. He does it for every player of color who now enjoys our great sport. And, and I think that resonated even more so with him. And, and of course, we they happened to be in our Monarchs exhibit when I got to the museum to catch up with them. And so they were standing right there next to uh, a piece that we had celebrating the great Elston Howard, whose career began right here in Kansas City with the great Kansas City Monarchs before becoming the first black Yankee and for becoming the first American League African-American MVP. And, and so naturally they were fascinated by Ellie and his roots being in Kansas City and I got to share little trivial things like the fact that when Ellie was playing for the Monarchs, you know who his roommate was? Ernie Banks. Yeah, the great Ernie Banks and Elston Howard were roommates. And Ernie Banks told me that they would sit up at night because by the time that they're both with the Monarchs, integration has already occurred. And so this was no longer on a pipe dream. They knew they had a chance to get there. And Ernie would say they would sit up at night and just dream out loud which of them would get to the major leagues first. And of course, Ernie gets there before his roommate, Elston Howard, and then Elston finally gets there. Of course, the Yankees converted him into a catcher. He was an outfielder with the Kansas City Monarchs. And he turned down a college scholarship to go to Ohio State to come play for Buck O'Neill and the Kansas City Monarchs. The Yankees converted him into a catcher, and he spent a lot of time in the minor leagues because when your catcher is Yogi Berra, well, chances are you ain't going to catch. And so Elston toiled in the minor leagues for a long time. But on when he got there, he became the heart and soul of those New York Yankee teams. And that was, and I think that was really eye-opening for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I honestly didn't realize that Ernie Banks was was in the Negro Leagues before he, he came to the majors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, you are um, celebrating the Monarchs, you know, the, this week and into November, uh, because uh, this is the 100th year anniversary of the first Negro Leagues World Series that the Monarchs won. Uh, tell me about, you know, the significance of this anniversary and what you're doing to celebrate it. Well, we certainly make the case that it was a tremendous milestone. 1924 the very first Negro League World Series. You see, when Andrew Roop Foster organized the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City in 1920, on he formed the Negro National League. Eight teams organized and made that Negro National League. In 1923, a brother by the name of Ed Bolden formed a rival league known as the Eastern Colored League. Rube and Bolden had some animosities. And so we didn't have a World Series in 23. But by 24, they were able to work out some of their differences and staged the very first Negro Leagues World Series, the Kansas City Monarchs against the Hilldale Club, which was based out of Darby, Pennsylvania, suburban Philadelphia. And of course, the Monarchs would win that inaugural Negro League World Series in an exciting nine game series. They actually played 10 games, but one game was called a tie because of darkness. The Monarchs would prevail five games to four to lay claim to that first World Series crown and became Kansas City's first major professional sports team champion of any kind in 1924. And in a city that hangs its hat on its championship pedigree, Kansas City Royals have won two World Series. The Kansas City Chiefs have won four Super Bowl titles. We feel, certainly believe that they got a chance to win three in a row and go for number five if all the stars align again. And as great as those two franchises have been, oh, and they don't come close to the winning legacy of the Kansas City Monarchs. Ten championships, two World Series. They didn't play a World Series every year. 
sent more players to the major leagues than any other Negro League franchise. They had one losing season in their almost 40 year existence in the Negro League. And that was during World War II when so many of their stars had been called into service. So they were a model baseball franchise. So this gives us an opportunity to tout just how significant the Monarchs were, but also for baseball fans to help them understand that through this World Series, the Negro Leagues were really kind of digging in and letting Major League Baseball know that they were here to be dealt with. So now we're going to stage our World Series, our World Series, essentially at the same time that you're staging your World Series. And I think Root was hoping that the winner of MLB's World Series would play the winner of the Negro Leagues World Series in one of those, let's just settle this all and determine who is the very best. Now, baseball wanted no part of that, so that never materialized. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been fun, though, have the Monarchs versus the Yankees back then. Um, um, and coming back to the present, um, you know, we're still not seeing levels of African-Americans playing at least Major League Baseball that we were in the, the 80s and 90s. But, you know, the, the, I think there are some positive signs in that direction. What's the state of, you know, black players in baseball right now? We know that there has been a tremendous decline in the participation of American-born black. There are a lot of players of color who play our game. Baseball is likely the most diverse of all the major sports, but it, as it relates to American-born Blacks, we've seen a tremendous decline from the time frame that you alluded to to the present day. But what encourages me is that, number one, both Major League Baseball and the Players Association have already acknowledged and started to implement programs to help essentially reverse this trend. And I do think that these programs are working because I've had the honor of being down in Vero Beach at the Jackie Robinson training complex for these elite baseball camps where there are some kids and they're coming down the pipeline. So we're getting more kids playing baseball. Now we've got to get them seen so that they can be in a position hopefully to get drafted and, and really make an entree into our sport as they pursue their major league careers. And I do think that that is going to happen. I remind people the one thing that we are not collectively as a society, we're not patient. Uh, and this is going to require patience. The decline didn't happen overnight. The fix won't occur overnight. So we do have to kind of allot time for these programs and things that are being implemented by major league baseball Major League Baseball's Players Association, USA Baseball, because they're dealing with this issue. And I think we're starting to see more and more American-born Black players drafted into the minor leagues. And as the minor leagues become greater populated, I think you can start to then kind of forecast when that pendulum will start to shift. Now, there's nothing relative to an exact science with baseball. You can be the number one draft pick and never get there, you know? So there's no exact science to baseball. Uh, unlike the other sports, you're number one pick in basketball and football, chances are you going to be on that opening day roster. It just doesn't work that way in baseball. And that's where the patience comes into play. But I am very encouraged and I'm even more encouraged and appreciative that both Major League Baseball and the Players Association have embraced the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum as part of the solution. Because I can't understate how important it is for urban kids to walk into an environment like the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, Owen, and see people who look just like them, who played this game as well as anyone ever played this game. But as I remind folks, not only did they play the game, they owned teams and they were managers and coaches and traveling secretaries, team physicians. They fulfilled every role within the business of baseball that could be fulfilled. And so, yes, we want our children to have access to this game. And I want them to dream about becoming a major leaguer, but I also want them to understand what other opportunities are available to them in this sport. And I think collectively we are addressing all of those issues as well. Yeah, Bob Kendrick, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Man, anytime, it's great to catch up with you and we look forward to seeing y'all here 
in KC sometime in the very near future. Not long ago, the Detroit Lions were basically a free win for any NFL team lucky enough to play them. Now they are among the best teams in the league. My next guest, center Frank Ragnow, has been with the team the entire time, and we spoke about what's changed, what hasn't, and some other NFL topics, like whether or not he'd be okay with an 18th game. That's coming up next. I'm joined now by Detroit Lions center Frank Ragnow. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. Uh, so you've been with the Lions your whole career, starting in 2018. And those those first few years were somewhat lean years in terms of just how the team was was doing and the standings. Uh, now you're one of the top teams in the NFL. How have you felt that change, you know, both in the team, but also in the stadium and maybe just walking around Detroit? That was a really nice way to put it. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we definitely uh, went through some uh, struggles early in my career. Um, I think it's just been uh, a collaboration of you, you get the right people with uh, Miss Sheila Hamp, um, Coach Campbell, Brad Holmes, bringing in the right people, kind of having the right guys establishing the culture of uh, the standard of what it takes, not only in games and practice and how we conduct our business, and then things slowly start to turn around. And then right now, hopefully we're reaping the rewards of it. And if you were to, if you could just like see a scene from, you know, 2019, let's say, looking around the stadium versus now, you know, let's say same kind of day, same weather, but would you be able to tell like which one's which just in terms of the fans and the vibe? You definitely would, but I will say this, uh, even in the tougher days when we weren't winning as much games, I felt like our fans consistently brought it and, uh, that's a hats off to them. They were, they were supporting of us through the thick and thin and, uh, we're very appreciative of that. You know, a lot of just in the short time, or not that short, but you know, in, um, it's short for this kind of thing. Um, a lot of positions have the value that teams put on them have changed just, you know, in the last six, seven years, you know, like mm -hmm. running back, linebacker come to mind, maybe wide receiver. How do you, has center been more steady or have you felt those sorts of changes as well? Uh, I feel like people are starting to realize, um, I guess the value of our position, uh, I still think there's a way to go. I think uh, the center does a lot of things that people don't realize, and it's been cool to see slowly and steadily that people are recognizing all we do up front um, for our teammates. What do you think people kind of don't fully realize in terms of what you bring? Uh, it's, it's different from offense to offense, but uh, we're kind of set in the protections. Uh, we're the ones telling each and every player up front and sometimes the running backs and tight ends as well where to go, who to block, um, where the pressure's coming, kind of aligning everything and making sure that kind of the whole operation goes well. Obviously, the quarterback's a big part of that too, but I think people don't realize how much the center can be a part of that. You guys always play on Thanksgiving. Um, does that feel like a different game, you know, each time you do that? Yeah, there's definitely like a, a real, real buzz in the building. I feel like we walk in, no matter how our season's going, I think uh, – Detroit Lions take pride in that tradition, and uh, we as players do too. It's a, it's a cool tradition to be a part of, and it's always it's always a lot of fun. Speaking of feeding people, I know you're doing some work with Campbell's this year. Uh, tell me about what, what you're doing there. Yeah, so I'm working with uh, Campbell's, and uh, obviously myself as a center, I'm supposed to not give up sacks, but this is a unique situation where I'm encouraging my teammates and I'm encouraging uh, players across the league to get sacks because every sack uh, – that's gotten in the NFL this year. Campbell's donates a hundred or a thousand meals to feeding America, so that's pretty cool. And uh, it's just it's just a very easy thing to be a part of. Um, I just think it's a no brainer to be able to help anyone we can to not go hungry. It's a great idea. And have you thought about sort of the impact that you want to have off the field, whether in business or philanthropy or just in your community? I just hope people think I'm a good guy. I don't know. I just try to do do the right thing, uh, use my platform to help those in need and just kind of do what I think makes sense and is good for everybody else. Got a, a few kind of rapid fire questions for you. Good I would me. say the best part about playing in Detroit is? Uh, I This is more Michigan. I really like mm -hmm. to fish and hunt and uh, Michigan is the sportsman's paradise. Um, the NFL's, you know, getting more and more adventurous in terms of where they go overseas. Obviously, London's a, a mainstay. Germany is, you know, pretty regular now as well. Where would you like to see the league go next? 
Canada? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, sure. I, yeah. Wherever Big they want to go, I guess I'll go. 18th game to the season, yes or no? No. Yeah, and seeing you were you were in the league when it went from 16 to 17, right? So, Correct. Yeah. Um, what what was that feeling like? You know, could you feel that in your body that extra game? Yeah, you can feel. Uh, yeah, you can feel uh, <laughs> everything, and I just think I understand. Obviously, from a money factor and for the fans, it makes sense. But there's going to be a lot more hurt players, and I feel like that will hurt the product. But what do I know? <laughs> yeah, um, along those lines. Thursday games. Um, I, I think players, you know, I've, I've seen different opinions on this. Some say like oh, they're the worst. Some say, you know, but then you get the week and a half off. Um, what, what are your thoughts on those? I'm indifferent. I feel like as long as there's just well, maybe one a year per team, that's fine because yeah, it is a quick week and a hard turnaround, but having those few days off after isn't bad. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's also you know a natural thing to want because um, you know you get half your your games in division, or I guess not quite half anymore. But um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the the rest is kind of wherever. Um, yeah, speaking of your division, it's there, there are no bad teams in your division anymore. Um, what, what's that been like? You know, with I'm I'm sure division games, there's always an extra challenge, but um, the, the, you you guys really like there aren't any weak spots right now. Um, how has that affected, you know, how you prepare for the season? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's going to be, end up being the, obviously we're still pretty early in the season, but it's one of the best divisions in football. And, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great challenge for us because, uh, hopefully we can, uh, get through it pretty well and then we'll be, uh, battle tested for the playoffs, but it's going to, every, every game's going to be a challenge. And that's the beautiful thing about this league is the competitiveness is incredible. So we've definitely got our uh, hands full. And you guys made a playoff run last year. Uh, did that change how you view the league and and the the goals that you have? Uh, yeah, I think uh, once you get a taste of winning, it's pretty uh, addicting, and you really you just want more and more. And to be so close and come up short is so frustrating. And uh, but it's definitely been used as uh, motivation. I feel like in the back of me and my teammates' minds for sure. Frank Ragno, good luck on the rest of the season, and thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The Professional Women's Hockey League could add two new teams next year. The league is gearing up for its second season, which begins in one month. Currently has six teams, which play in Boston, Toronto, Minnesota, New York, Ottawa, and Montreal. The league has played neutral site games in Pittsburgh and Detroit, both of which seem like potential expansion targets. Detroit and Chicago would give them all the NHL's original six cities. Either way, the league has an open map to work with as it looks to grow. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend or give us a shout out on social media. We're always happy to hear from you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.